Good evening and welcome to AWARE on the Air, presented by members and friends of AWARE, the anti-war, anti-racism effort, a local Champaign-Urbana peace group. I'm Carlos DeBrook. We're recording this at noon on Tuesday, May 1st, in the studios of Urbana Public Television, Urbana, Illinois. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing. In accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humane and genie est odisse cum laseris. It's human nature to hate those you have injured. At this moment, the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, although most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries in the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. As the rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda. What we do here at Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to oppose U.S. government killing around the world and to inform themselves about it. Two particularly crucial areas of U.S. war making this week, East Asia and West Asia. In East Asia, the remarkable success of anti-war diplomacy of the two Koreas. But the war party in the U.S., in and out of the administration, is working hard to undermine it. In West Asia, the U.S. looks like withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, in part because of the vicious warmongering of the Israeli government. The Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, has never been quite what it seems under Obama or now. It's not so much about nukes, nuclear weapons, as reincorporating Iran into America's overall system of control of Mideast energy flows, the U.S. weapon against competing economies. Robert Naiman of Just Foreign Policy says, Trump is threatening the Iran deal as a pressure tactic to get the Europeans to adopt a more aggressive stance to Iran on issues outside the deal. He might follow through on that threat, but he might not. He might try to do something in between. We will see." Close quote. The important point here is that it is part of the American foreign policy for the Middle East, and that's the real issue. New Iran's nuclear weapons the non-existent nuclear weapons of Iran have nothing to do with it. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuke deal, uh, is an international agreement uh, with Iran reached in Vienna in July 2015 with the P5 plus one, that is the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the U.S., plus Germany and the European Union. Trump threatens to withdraw from this agreement on May 12th. The other members of the agreement want to maintain it, with the exception of Israel, uh, or with the opposition of Israel, which wants to destroy the agreement uh, in order to promote its belligerence against uh, Iran. Last Sunday, a week ago last Sunday, uh, there were two strikes on the Syrian military bases uh, controlled by the government of President Assad. These two strikes apparently came from Israel. Israel attacked Syria, uh, Syria's military bases, two military bases, a week ago last Sunday. Uh, and the attacks were serious enough to register as a 2.6 magnitude earthquake uh, in the vicinity of the Damascus 
of the Assyrian town of Hama. On Sunday evening, the Syrian army stated that its bases on the outskirts of the city of Homs in the district of Aleppo had been attacked. A Syrian human rights organization said the attack had been on the home base of the 47th Brigade, the Syrian army, at which Iranian forces are stationed and on bases belonging to the regime of President Assad in the area of the Salhab airport west of Hama. Several dozen people died in the attack. The uh, attacks were apparently carried out by Israel in promoting a war, uh, the, the, the war in Syria, and a war against Iran, uh, which is aiding Syria in its fight against terrorists. The attack apparently targeted major arm caches, including surface-to-surface -surface missiles that Iran seeks to deploy in Syria. Last week, reports said that the U.S. US and Israel spy agencies have been watching movements of Iranian arms to Syria, and Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman said that Israel will not allow Iran to set up positions and bases in Syria from which to fire missiles. Uh, this is uh, uh, outrageous on a number of levels, including uh, Israel's suggestion that uh, it will continue to attack Syria for its own purposes. Uh, the Iranian nuclear deal is involved because it is precisely the Iranian presence in Syria that Israel says is the excuse for its attacks on Syria. The uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, the international organization that promotes the uh, peaceful use of, of nuclear energy and inhibits the military use, the head of that organization said on March 5th, as of today, I can state that Iran is implementing its nuclear-related rel commitments. That is to say, Iran is observing the so-called nuclear deal. Yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu gave a speech, a public speech, in English, because his audience was American uh, even more than Israel, uh, with uh, visual aids designed to give President Trump political space to exit from the Iran deal, uh, as Trump apparently plans to do. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu introduced alternative facts to undercut the IAEAs, the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency's thorough verification of uh, Iran's uh, observance of the deal. In fact, Netanyahu advisor, Netanyahu advisor Dror Mitchman all but admitted that the Israeli attacks, uh, there have been two of them, uh, on Syria, on Iranian personnel in Syria, was designed to promote, promote an Iranian response and war with Iran and the destruction of the Iran uh, nuclear deal. The strategy of dragging the U.S. into a regional conflagration couldn't be more clear. In 2003, Netanyahu's lies before Congress about Iraq's nuclear and WMD capacity were a critical factor in pushing the U.S. to invade Iraq, along with bogus intelligence advanced by neocons in the United States. He has now moved on to Iran where his lies persist today. As usual, Israel is waging an information war to push the U.S. into a real war on its behalf. Netanyahu in 1990 urged the U.S. to carry out a war of regime, regime change against Iraq to destroy Saddam's non-existent nuclear program. The result were a million dead Iraqis. The U.S. Israel and Saudi Arabia are setting the scene for war. They're filling in the justifications to fit a preordained conclusion, just like before the invasion of Iraq. Code, Pink, Code founder Midia Benjamin told Common Dreams uh, in an article this week. The U.S., Israel, and Saudi Arabia are setting the scene for war. They're filling in the justifications to fit a preordained conclusion, just like before the invasion of Iraq. In a bizarre performance yesterday, 
that conjured memories of former National Security Advisor Colin Powell, infamous weapons of mass destruction speech in the UN in 2002, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu th yesterday theatrically deployed props and PowerPoint slides in an attempt to distort facts and convince his audience of one, U.S. President Donald Trump, that Iran is failing to comply with the nuclear accord. Iran lied big time after signing the nuclear deal in 2015. Netanyahu claimed from a stage in Tel Aviv, Israel, dramatically unveiling shelves of disks and binders that he insisted contain conclusive proof that Iran is still pursuing nukes. But while Netanyahu made much of the, quote, incriminating blueprints, incriminating photos, incriminating videos, and more, that's the way he was talking, he supposedly revealed for the first time on Monday, that he supposedly revealed for the first time on Monday, critics argued that the Israeli Prime Minister's evidence largely consists of old information that has been repackaged for political purposes, but does nothing to undermine the nuclear accord. In fact, in fact according to the National Iranian American Council President Trita Parsi, uh, so I guessed here in Champaign-Urbana not that long ago, the concerns Netanyahu raises about Iran's previous nuclear program were the exact reasons, quote, why the international community negotiated an agreement to limit the country's nuclear capacities in the first place. Netanyahu revealed nothing that indicates Iran is not upholding its obligations under the nuclear deal. Netanyahu's desperation to kill the Iran deal and drag the United States into war with Iran was on full display yesterday. Netanyahu played a key role in helping con the American people into the war with Iraq and is now pulling all, out all the stops to the, do the same with Iran. Responding to Netanyahu's performance on Monday, Frederica Morga Mogherini, High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, said the Prime Minister's speech has not put into question Iran's compliance with a nuclear deal. Medea Benjamin, co-founder of the anti-war group Code Pink, argued in a series of tweets on Monday that Netanyahu's remark were an effort to both distract from Israel's killing and terrible siege of Gaza and undermine an agreement international analysts say has been very effective. Quote, the U.S., Israel, and Saudi Arabia are setting the scene for war. They're filling in the justifications to fit a preordained conclusion, conclusion just like before the invasion of Iraq. Trump has Pompeo, the new Secretary of State, and Bolton, his national security advisor, ready to sell war. And war is a great distraction from domestic troubles. While well, Netanyahu's speech did little to convince experts and independent commentators that Iran is failing to live up to its commitments under the nuclear deal, the presentation certainly reached its intended audience. During a news conference with the president of Nigeria on Monday, Trump declared that Netanyahu's performance demonstrates that, quote, he has been 100 percent right in his criticism of the nuclear accord. The deadline for Trump to recertify the nuclear agreement is May 12th, and many believe the president will decide to withdraw from the deal. In recent weeks, both Iranian President Hassan Rouhani and Foreign Minister Havar uh, Mohammad Zarif have reminded the international community that their country has no desire and no plans to build a nuclear weapon. With or without the nuclear deal, Iran does not seek to acquire, to acquire weapons of mass destruction, Rotani said in a televised speech last week. In its response to Netanyahu's speech on Monday, Parsi of Nyack argued it's hard to believe it's a coincidence that not Netanyahu's, uh, Netanyahu's announcement comes on the heels of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's meeting with the Israeli Prime Minister. Trump's war cabinet has not even been in place for a week, but is already setting the stage for an all-out regional war. Israel has long opposed the 2015 agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, which saw international sanctions on its main geopolitical rival, Iran, lifted in exchange for Iran curbing its controversial nuclear program. Iran Iranian media have dismissed Netanyahu's presentation, with a news agency Fars calling it a propaganda show, 
the state news agency IRNA, describing the Israeli prime minister as, quote, famous for ridiculous displays. He's referring to the cartoon of the bomb that uh, uh, Netanyahu waved before the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations with a fuse and a flame on it ready to blow up, saying this is what Iran is doing. Zarif said Netanyahu was undeterred by the cartoon fiasco at the UN General Assembly. After his meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on Sunday, Netanyahu said that the attempt of Iran to acquire nuclear weapons remains the greatest threat to Israel, the U.S., and the whole world, and therefore a war with Iran is necessary. Trump has slammed the Iran nuclear deal as, quote, the worst deal ever, and threatened to pull the U.S. out of the agreement. Trump's threat will be carried out if he doesn't renew a waiver on sanctions against Iran by May 12th. The leaders of the U.K., France, and Germany have vowed to defend the Iran nuclear deal in a joint statement on Sunday, calling it the best way to keep Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. Russian President Putin told Netanyahu after his speech yesterday, the Iran nuclear deal is of paramount importance for ensuring international stability and security. It must be strictly observed by all parties. A good time this week to write your congressional representatives and any other political figures around and suggest that the threat of the United States to withdraw from this important agreement uh, is a very big mistake. You're watching Aware on the Air, uh, the attempt of the local anti-war group Aware to talk about the war news that we don't hear much of on the media uh, and uh, encourage you to write to your government representatives in Congress and elsewhere about the importance uh, of pulling back the war making that the U.S. is doing around the world. We turn now to a uh, place where the U.S. is involved in the war uh, and indeed perhaps uh, can be doing uh, something worthwhile. Uh, this is rare enough to deserve note, to d deserve note. Uh, the position of aware and other war anti-war groups uh, around the country is that the U.S. should simply remove its troops from the Middle East and its weapons from the Middle East uh, as the major contributor to the war to wars throughout the region. But there is a peculiar case uh, in the area called Rojava. Rojava is the uh, is in northern Syria, uh, the western part of the Kurdish territory in Syria. The Kurds, as a people, uh, occupy parts of northern Syria and parts of Iraq. Uh, and the area of Rojava uh, has a political identity that is established in opposition to hostile groups uh, all around it. When the city of Raqqa in Syria fell in 2017 after a long siege by the U.S.-backed and Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, Raqqa was the capital of ISIS, the uh, uh, Islamic State group, when Raqqa fell, it was generally thought that ISIS was defeated, save for some mopping up. But in January of this year, Turkey invaded Anfran, one of the three cantons in Rojava, also called the Democratic Federation of Northern Syria. This meant that scores of Syrian Democratic Forces fighters, who had just overcome ISIS, had to leave the battle against ISIS in order to defend their homes, family, and neighbors in Anfran against the Turkish invasion. After extensive airstrikes, the city of Anfran fell on March 18th, fell to the Turkish invaders, confronting the already troubled region with yet another humanitarian crisis 
as thousands of people fled to escape the Turkish army and its Syrian National Army allies. The Syrian National Army are jihadist rebel groups, and some fighters are either openly aligned with al-Qaeda or even recent members of ISIS, but uh, are opposing the legitimate Syrian government in Damascus. In Damascus. Many of those who fled Af Afrin, Afrin are now sleeping in open fields or in tent cities, lacking the most elementary necessities. Those who remain have been subjected to the same kind of ethnic discrimination, looting, and sexual violence that ISIS perpetrated against the Yazidis in Iraq. At least 15 girls have been reported as having been abducted, and there's family fears they are being held as sex slaves. These are Kurds uh, under attack by the Turkish army. A number of notable figures are launching the Emergency Committee for Rojava as part of a global campaign to draw attention to this new crisis and to Afrin's call for support. The Turkish attack on Afrin was entirely unprovoked. In fact, Afrin was so peaceful for most of the Syrian war that it became a safe haven for tens of thousands of refugees, some of whom are now refugees for a second time. In the cantons they controlled, the Kurdish-led forces had established an oasis, unique in Syria, of local self-government, women's rights, and secular rule. Yet the Turkish government cynically claims that it is threatened by Rojava because the people leading it, who have been the U.S. leading allies in the fight against ISIS in Syria, are, quote, terrorists, close quote, quote, close quote. While well, the attack on Afrin is a violation of international law, comparable to those of the Assad government, the Trump administration has made only feeble protests against President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's, uh, of Turkey, depredations. By accepting Turkey's attack, the U.S. has become complicit in Erdogan's ethnic cleansing plan to expel the Kurds once and for all from a part of Syria where they lived for centuries and to eradicate the democratic experiment developing in Rojava. Encouraged by the lack of response from the U.S., Erdogan is threatening to take his military campaign deeper into Syria, to Manjib, the, the town of Manbij, where there are American troops, and even into Iraqi Kurdistan. It's clear that this campaign is already benefiting ISIS in multiple ways. To stop this madness, Turkey must be isolated economically, diplomatically, and militarily, until it withdraws its troops and its proxy militias from Kurdish Syria. In the long run, there can be no peace in the region until Turkey is willing to reopen negotiation with its own Kurds and grant all its citizens democratic rights, including freedom of expression and the right to form political parties and win elections without reprisals, which is not the case in Turkey today. There is an emergency committee for Rojava made up on of a number of uh, international political figures, and it's calling on the U.S. government to, one, impose economic and political sanction on Turkey's leadership, two, embargo sales and delivery of weapons from NATO countries to Turkey, three, insist upon Rojava's representation in Syrian peace negotiations, and four, continue military support for the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces with the Kurds of Rojava at their center. A number of signatories and supporters, as I say, have uh, joined in a call for the U.S. and its allies to end their tacit acquiescence in Turkey's military adventure and restore peace and safety to the people of Rojava. There is a website, defendrojava.org, uh, where you can find more about this and see the number of signat uh, signatories uh, for this statement. You're watching Aware on the Air. We have uh, a few minutes left to turn to uh, Noe's Notes, the notes put together by our research director, uh, Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson, uh, and uh, turn, the turn to this week, particularly, the coverage of war news uh, by uh, su supposedly liberal outlets such as Democracy Now! Uh, and The Intercept, alternatives to mainstream media when they are constructed that are showing some peculiar um, 
tergiversations uh, in relation to the current uh, war making in the Middle East with the U.S. at its heart. This is a, a critique of democracy now from the Black Agenda Report, uh, a uh, website that I recommend highly uh, for a number of important writers on political topics. Uh, this is from Danny Haifong. The Democrats and the Republican allies seek a more stable administration in Washington to properly manage the affairs of the ruling class. That's the source of their opposition to Trump. Those affairs mainly deal with the questions of austerity and war. Trump has been deemed morally unfit for the presidency by spooks like James Comey because his unpredictable and egoist tendencies make him less interested in the preservation of empire and more interested in the preservation of the voting bloc and conditions that made his presidency possible. We largely have the cruise missile left, that is pro-war liberals, so to speak, to thank for the lack of an alternative to the crisis of U.S. imperialism. The cruise missile le left, those pro-war liberals, has aligned, have aligned with the Democratic Party and the intelligence agencies against Trump and had dropped any anti-war, anti-imperialist, and anti-capitalist tendencies in the process. Nowhere is this clearer than its position on Syria. The cruise missile left is best represented by the likes of Democracy Now! and The Intercept. Both sources have worked together to subtly forward the agenda of U.S. imperialism. Since 2011, Amy Goodman has never strayed from the NATO line on countries such as Libya, Syria, and Russia. Like the corporate media, Goodman and her staff at Democracy Now! have provided positive coverage of so-called humanitarian groups like the White Helmets, which have long been proven to work directly with NATO-armed jihadist mercenaries ravaging Syria. The Intercept and Democracy Now! have refused to invite any guests on their show that deviate from the NATO line on Syria. These sources have benefited from the corporate takeover of the U.S. media. Democracy Now! and The Intercept act as an escape valve from corporate media lies, which makes them more difficult to criticize when they serve the same interests as the corporate media outlets that spurred their formation. In their coverage of the alleged chemical attack in Douma in Syria, both Amy Goodman and Glenn Greenwald, principal figures of these two groups, joined the imperial chorus that the Syrian government bore responsibility for an attack that had yet to be proven ever even happened. Even Secretary of Defense James Mad Dog Mattis admitted that the U.S. lacked evidence backing up their claims against Assad for being responsible for these attacks. The Intercept and Democracy Now! staked their firm position against the Syrian government despite the overwhelming evidence that Syria destroyed its chemical weapons in the, in the uh, internationally brokered deal between Russia and the U.S. in 2013, and that Syria, Russia, and their allies are the only parties interested in coming to a peaceful resolution of the war. That doesn't prove that Syria wasn't responsible for these gas attacks, but it certainly raises some serious questions about it, and not to uh, uh, understand uh, that those questions uh, make a mockery of, of the uh, punishment of Syria uh, that the U.S. attacks uh, are supposed to represent uh, is clearly to mistake what's going on. Cruise missile leftists thus bear much of the responsibility for the U.S., U.K., and French airstrikes conducted against Syria on April 14th. After the strikes, Amy Goodman invited Chelsea Manning and the so-called activist Rama Kudiyami to her show. Manning was given little time to speak, while over 70 percent of the joint interview was taken up by Kudiyami's assertions that U.S. airstrikes enable the Syrian regime. Kudiyami practically begged the U.S. to conduct the airstrikes correctly and fulfill the legitimate demand of the Syrian people to overthrow the Syrian government. That is, of course, the position of the U.S. government uh, from the Obama administration on. Nowhere did Amy Gooden challenge such blatant support 
of U.S. imperial objectives in Syria and beyond. Uh, Dr. No uh, notes here, not only do I refer to my earlier notes on who funds the White Helmets, courtesy of RT, but it's worth pointing out that David Green, my colleague on the News from Neptune show, and Dr. No weren't the only ones to notice Greenwald's unchallenged assertion on Democracy Now! Green, Green, Greenwald said then, I quote, so obviously the use of chemical weapons in any instance is horrific. It's a war crime. It's heinous. It ought to be strongly condemned by everybody. I think the evidence is quite overwhelming that the perpetrators of this chemical weapons attack, as well as previous ones, is the Assad government. Now, this is surely a minority opinion. Although in war there are always lots of reasons to doubt, and we certainly, certainly shouldn't run off and make hasty decisions until there's a real investigation to make the evidence available. There's nothing to quote from Amy Goodman on this because she let Greenwald go on without asking where he got the evidence to back such an audacious claim, a claim even Mad Dog Mattis did not make. So, since Goodman won't ask, I will. The evidence is quite overwhelming. Exactly what evidence was Greenwald referring to? Some U.S., U.K., French so-called authority claiming otherwise? I think this is important to clear up precisely because Greenwald, someone we usually consider to be quite reasonable and insightful, did not take his own advice and wait until there's a real investigation to render an opinion. Isn't that the kind of reaction we expect and indeed receive from the neocons? Also note that nobody from Democracy Now! corrected, chastised, or challenged him on this in any way. The interview proceeded along as if everything he said was right and proper. Dr. Doe concludes, I think it's time to consider that Democracy, D Democracy Now! doesn't have our anti-war interests at heart. The self-titled War and Peace Report might be a right title if you consider that they never challenged some wars or push, push for peace in certain parts of the world." Close quote. Now, I think Dr. No may be being a little harsh on this point, but it's certainly true that our so-called liberal media have shown some peculiar wavering on giving an alternative account to the one that most Americans receive from mainstream media. And they should at least promote the discussion of these matters instead of accepting uh, the, uh, the accounts that mainstream media puts forward for the military depredations of the United States from Libya to Syria. There is uh, a good deal more f uh, from uh, news notes that will be on the Facebook page for uh, Aware on the Air, uh, uh, particularly on Russiagate. And we will conclude tonight with a uh, uh, piece on Russiagate and its relationship to the campaign of Jill Stein, the Green Party presidential candidate, whom I voted for, uh, the Green Party presidential candidate who's been drawn in to this Russiagate nonsense uh, in quite a remarkable way, and an account of the how that uh, wretched campaign continues, the attempt to uh, uh, undermine the uh, thing that got uh, Donald Trump in part elected president, that is the attempt to do deals with Russia and other belligerents, such as the spectacular deal with North Korea that seems to be emerging right now. Uh, to maintain the deal with Iran seems to me to be exactly the sorts of things that should be done now, and that the Russiagate people, primarily the Democrats and the Clinton campaign but others, are doing their best to uh, destroy uh, this week. They should not be allowed to do so. You've been watching Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, in the 18th week of 2018, Workers' May Day. Another week in which the world can see that the most extensive global terrorism is U.S. worldwide war making. My thanks tonight to Dr. Doe, Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research, uh, and do see No's notes on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, and other things including a link to Noam Chomsky and Daniel Ellsberg discussing nuclear war. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Leggett and Ethan Young and Andrew Scholarly. 
Thanks to him also, this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. There is an AWARE meeting this coming Sunday, 5 to 6 p.m. at Hammerhead Coffee, University Avenue at Wright Street in Campus Town. That's Sunday, 5 to 6 p.m. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others, truth-tellers persecuted by the U.S. government. Now, this is Carl Esterbrook for Karen Aram, Karen Evans Levy, Stuart Levy, David Green, Ed Mandel, and other members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck. It's the real news. I'm Ben Norton. The Green Party has come under attack as the Russia Gate dragnet has expanded and is being used to attack leftist political opposition. Back in December, the Senate Intelligence Committee requested that the 2016 presidential campaign of Green Party candidate Jill Stein hand over its campaign documents. On Thursday, April 26th, Jill Stein publicly announced that she had complied with the request and had submitted emails and other campaign documents to the Senate Intelligence Committee. There is no evidence linking the Green Party to the Russian government. Jill Stein has come under attack because she did interviews on the Russian state media outlet RT and because she attended an RT event in Moscow. Despite this, media outlets have implied that the Green Party is part of an elaborate Kremlin conspiracy. Even liberal media outlets like MSNBC have given a platform to U.S. government officials like the former U.S. ambassador to Russia to smear the Green Party. The margin that Jill Stein took in this election, if you were to work it backwards and you were a little conspiratorial, one might assume that it was, it was enough to defeat Hillary Clinton, which was a good investment if the Russians were involved in that. Well, yeah, let's be careful. We don't know exactly why people voted for whom, and uh, it's very difficult to measure causality here. But the two things are very obvious, that she took votes away from somebody, and most likely those voters were for, from Hillary Clinton. And two, there's a likelihood that she suppressed voter turnout for Secretary Clinton. So even if they didn't vote for her, uh, the, those that supported those ideas and were less likely to vote for her because she was trumpeting issues and uh, positions that were anti-Clinton. That was the former U.S. ambassador to Russia speaking on MSNBC. And what's funny about that segment is the host admits it's conspiratorial. But uh, joining us to discuss this alleged conspiracy is Jill Stein herself. Jill is a physician and a longtime activist. She ran for president on the Green Party ticket in both 2012 and 2016. Thanks for joining us here at The Real News, Jill. Great to be with you, Ben. So could you respond to all of this, please? Why is the Senate Intelligence Committee going after you and the Green Party? <laughs> well, you know, there you had it, sort of the usual, shall we say, the arrogance of the Democratic Party establishment, assuming that votes belong to Hillary Clinton. And if, if there was another candidate who got votes, they had to be taken away from somebody, as if our votes belong to the two establishment parties, which actually a majority of voters and a growing majority of voters are saying, you know, are not serving us. They're not serving we the people. People are clamoring for other options. And also, you know, let's look at the facts. There were exit polls that showed that people who voted for me by and large would not have come out to vote if they hadn't had me or a Green Party candidate to vote for. It was like, over 60% of, of people who voted for me would not have otherwise voted. And remember, already there were like 45% of American voters who were not voting. There were 75% of American voters who were screaming for other options, who wanted um, open debates so that they could find out who else they could vote for. And last but not least, the majority of people who voted for Donald Trump were not for Donald Trump. They were voting against the other option. It is preposterous for the naysayers to keep pretending that they own our votes and to keep pretending that there's no solution here and to blame the options, 
you know, the other candidates that people are clamoring for. They could just change the voting system as the state of Maine is trying to do against the um, will of the Democratic and Republican parties. But there is a fix here. I won't spend a lot of time, but just to acknowledge that this is so uh, off target and mean spirited to keep trying to drive away political resistance and blaming the the choices that people are clamoring for. Instead, we could change to a ranked choice voting system that lets people rank their choices. So you know that if your first choice loses, your vote's automatically reassigned to your second choice. There doesn't have to be any question about splitting the vote or taking votes away or unintended consequences or having to vote your fears because the politics of fear has actually brought us everything we were afraid of. So bottom line, that's just preposterous what the uh, former ambassador, whoever that was, was saying, you know, I couldn't see the film to know uh, who that was. I couldn't see the video. But that's just like ridiculous and is more of this nonsense that we continue to get from the Democratic National Committee. The latest example being their lawsuit here, which again tries to divert attention from the critical issues that people are fighting right now, as Norman Solomon said in his recent piece, you know, instead of fighting Wall Street, they're fighting WikiLeaks. They're not only fighting WikiLeaks, they're fighting dissent in general, and they are warmongering and um, censoring and trying to silence political opposition. This is more of the same. Yeah, and what do you say to critics who say that uh, you went to Moscow for this RT gala? Of course, Thousands of people go on RT to do interviews pretty regularly, and before two years ago, that was not seen as anything unusual. Um, but what do you say to the Democrats who say, well, you are in this photo sitting next to Vladimir Putin, and then therefore this is proof that you're part of some elaborate Kremlin conspiracy? So that was all public knowledge. There was nothing... Um, untoured, there was nothing secret, there were no backroom deals. It's been explained a million times and it was actually explained in real time where it was clear that we were fundraising in order to do this. I was going to deliver a message basically supporting peace and diplomacy. I actually criticized the Russians when I was there for their new bombing campaign in Syria. They had just entered into that war and I said in no uncertain terms that they were following in the footsteps of a failed catastrophic US policy. People may disagree with that opinion, and I know that's, you know, there are a lot of opinions about that, but I was hardly going to um, make backroom deals. Uh, there was no question about money changing hands. Unlike most of the people who've been dragged into the investigation, you know, I received not a penny, <laughs> uh, made no backroom uh, uh, deals, no quid per quo, nothing of the sort. In fact, I was offered. Um, uh, support for transportation and, and hotel and all that, which I declined. Not only did I not get a fee, I didn't even get reimbursement for it. I was there to promote our policy, the same policy that I was um, advancing throughout the election. And that's a policy that the American people are actually really interested in hearing. It's about how we could have a foreign policy based on international law human rights and diplomacy instead of on, you know, on uh, economic and military domination, how we can come to grips with this nuclear crisis, which is really exploding in many places around the world, which the US uh, and Russia, but particularly the US in withdrawing from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, you know, a couple decades ago under George Bush, you know, things have been unraveling ever since we're not in a good way. We need to be talking to each other. And there are many Americans right now who are not happy whatsoever with this endless state of war that has cost us over $5 trillion since 9-11, uh, uh, which is growing by leaps and bounds, which now occupies 57% of our discretionary budget. The next biggest expenditure uh, of funds that Congress has control over you know, you go from 57%, number two is like 7%. So it's absolutely, you know, we have a military budget with a few 
uh, you know, window pieces of window dressing around it. And it is, it has huge consequences for what this means for us uh, here at home, for housing, for education, for bailing out students, which we should be doing for the cost of our nuclear weapons program begun under Obama, but which um, you know is obviously continuing under uh, under Donald Trump. It's 1.5 trillion dollars for a new generation of nuclear weapons, which is absolutely suicidal and is part of this arms race that we're also engaged in. So we're kind of reaching the end of the road right now with this militarization of our economy, of our foreign policy, and of society in general with terrible consequences at home for our democracy. And, you know, the issues I was putting on the table throughout the campaign were the same issues that I was putting on the table in my efforts to speak to the media, to a broad international audience, to uh, leadership and uh, everyday people, activists in Russia, uh, as well as China, as well as Jeremy Corbyn, who were all, people that I had an opportunity to talk with as a part of that trip. It wasn't just to Moscow, it was also to the Paris Climate, the Climate Accords, where I had the opportunity to share these policies with a whole lot of people, also including the uh, deputy lead climate negotiator from China. So there were a variety of officials who were very interested in this other point of view that we don't get to hear from. How many polls have we seen? lately about where the American people stand. You know, they did a poll in the UK just before the, uh, the airstrikes by the UK, the US, and France. You may know about this, Ben, but you know, many people out there don't because this kind of information, shall we say, is not being propagated. Support for that kind of aggressive policy was running 22% in, uh, in the UK. And there've been no polls that I've been able to find you know, establishing what it is in the U.S., where people are even denied the opportunity to hear another point of view. Well, we're going to have to end part of one of our discussion here with Jill Stein. And please join us at The Real News for part two, in which we will continue discussing Russiagate, the Senate Intelligence Committee's investigation, and the overall talking point of interference in the U.S. election and, and what other actors are interfering in the U.S. election. Thanks for joining us, Jill. Thank you. It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Israeli military attacked several bases in Hama and Aleppo countryside on Sunday. Israel is becoming notorious for their weekly attacks on Syria, targeting Syrian government forces that are backed by Iranian and Hezbollah forces. Israel has previously hit Iranian-backed militia outposts in Syria, mainly targeting arms convoys of the Lebanese Shia group Hezbollah. Israel regards the group which is fighting alongside President Bashar al-Assad as the biggest threat on its borders. Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, reported that some 200 missiles were destroyed and 11 Iranians were killed in the process, which Iran denies at this time. In the meantime, Netanyahu has been granted war powers authority in extreme situations by the Knesset, the only with only the defense minister's approval. This in spite of the fact that the Joint Committee of Foreign Affairs and a Defense Committee, as well as the Constitution, Law and Justice Committee, all rejected Netanyahu's request for such powers. On to discuss all of this with me is Larry Wilkerson. Colonel Wilkerson is former Chief of Staff to the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, and now a distinguished professor at the College of William and Mary. Thank you so much for joining me, Larry. Good to be here. Larry, what is the purpose on the part of Israel pursuing this kind of aggression in Syria, antagonizing Iran at a time when this war is actually coming to a closure? Israel does not want it to come to a conclusion. Uh, Israel sees, as do the neoconservatives in this country and some others allied with them, like Richard Cheney, 
they see this chaos in the Middle East as conducive to their security. Not only as conducive to their security, but also as sort of allowing them to do their full greater Zionist strategy, which is to get as much territory as they can, as fast as they can, to include the water in that territory, which is becoming a, a rather critical issue for, for uh, the entire region, but for Israel, certainly. And they want this condition to continue. They want it ultimately to lead to the breaking up of Syria, the breaking up of Iraq, if it can happen, and the regime uh, change in Iran. And they see this chaos and this constant conflict in the United States, instrumental to that, as being the strategic means by which to accomplish this purpose. So they are in no way wanting this conflict to end. They want it to continue and to continue and continue. That's Israel's policy. So, Larry, what's going on in Syria at the moment? There's some conflicting reports we are hearing from Haaretz in particular that uh, some 200 missiles were dropped uh, by the Israelis on Syria. But now we are hearing that it's much, uh, much fewer missiles and some drone attacks. Uh, what are you hearing? Well, if we're hearing it from Haaretz, it's probably accurate. That's one of the few sources of media in Israel that you roughly can trust anymore. I think what I'm hearing, though, is not unlike what I just conducted in a simulation here at Women Mary with my students playing, role-playing the members of the National Security Council, the U.S. National Security Council. And that is that Bibi Netanyahu and Avigdor Lieberman is defense minister and Likud in general, though I'm, I'm hearing that there's some infighting in Likud even, are one, trying to emphasize everything they can about Iran's perfidy so that they make sure that on May 12th, uh, Donald Trump exits the nuclear agreement with Iran. The second thing I'm hearing, and this is more fundamental, this is what we actually exercised in my simulation with my students, is that Israel is preparing everyone in the region itself, the United States, its sugar daddy, um, for more robust Israeli military action inside Syria and possibly inside Lebanon as well. This action would be aimed primarily, initially at least, through air attacks at those storages of missiles and other munitions by Hezbollah in Iran inside Syria, and those elements of Iranian forces inside Syria that Israel feels are, in short, getting too close. And so they need to be taught a lesson. Um, as far as what's going on right now, immediately, I've heard that the plumes, the explosions, the, the, the degree of rocketry, if you will, bombs dropped, whatever, was quite, quite dramatic last night, that it lit the night sky for a, a, a range of distance and, and time that sort of looked a little like the opening of the war in Iraq in March of 2003, and that the Israelis were very serious about several places. Uh, you mentioned Amman, you mentioned Aleppo, that they knew the Iranians had missiles stacked up and Hezbollah had missiles and so forth, so they struck them. I think we're looking at what could grow and grow and grow as Israel finds no check on its power and finds that it is actually delivering body blows, so to speak, to both Hezbollah and Iran inside Syria. So look for more of this. Now, Larry, uh, Haaretz is reporting that 200 missiles were destroyed and some 11 Iranians have been killed. But the Iranians are denying that. Why are they doing that? I think some words I heard out of Israel, actually, out of the Israeli Defense Force just a few moments ago, um, were that Iran was going to deny that any Iranians were killed because then that would mean immediately Iran has to you know, concoct some kind of reaction. They have to actually respond uh, with military force or in whatever way they would deem appropriate to respond. Saving face, you might call it. So Iran doesn't admit that any Iranians were killed. But that same Israeli source for me said that uh, Iran will respond 
they will respond in time and in a means by means that they find uh, conducive to their interests. So Israel had best batten down the hatches, there will be a response. I don't, I don't know which of those is more accurate. I suspect that the figures I'm hearing of 16 or 17 Iranian kill, Iranians kill um, is probably accurate. Um, and what Iran will do in response to that is probably in accordance with that second Israeli interpretation, and that is that they will do something, but we'll not see it for a while. And we may not see it at all, but Israel will certainly feel it. Um, what that means is probably uh, other than conventional military strike back. It could mean Hez Hezbollah missiles. That's what Netanyahu and Lieberman, I think, are trying to uh, elicit. They, they would like some missiles shot at them. Uh, that's their excuse for doing even more and perhaps even entering the fray with uh, armored artillery and other forces than just their air force. So this is precisely what Netanyahu and Lieberman would like is an excuse to do even more. All right, Larry, finally, uh, we know that uh, the new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, swiftly took off on a trip to Saudi Arabia, and I understand he's landing in Israel this morning. What is this trip about, and is this convention as far as uh, Secretary of State is concerned? I find it rather uh, alarming that this would be the first trip that Secretary of State Pompeo would make without even having lit, apparently, at the State Department for a moment or two. Um, and coming on the heels of Trump's visit to Riyadh and his sword dance and all the other things that came out of that, I find it very, very indicative of the amateur hour that this administration is that we would choose to demonstrate these kinds of priorities in the world. Uh, he did stop in uh, uh, Brussels. He did go to NATO. Uh, so the, the more important things in the world, he, he apparently has brushed off and moved on to Jerusalem, Riyadh, and so forth. This, this is an alarming uh, condition of this amateur hour in the White House right now that they see these places as being most critical to U.S. security. They are not. If you want what they are most critical to, it is Israel's security. And that's why Pompeo is there. And that's why Trump went to Riyadh. So we're talking about, again, a single state having this kind of influence over U.S. foreign and security policy. And with the amateurs in the White House and the amateur at Foggy Bottom right now, that is an even more uh, deeply concerning issue for me that this would be what they would do right off the bat. And Larry, is there anyone uh, challenging this kind of uh, uh, foreign policy uh, approach on the part of the administration there in Washington? There doesn't seem to be, not from inside or from outside. I mean, you look at President Macron's recent, recent visit, Angela Merkel's recent visit. You look at what's coming out of Theresa May in London and what's coming out of Europe in general, uh, it, it's as if Trump has them kowtowed, uh, or he has them kowtowing to him. He has them uh, stymied. Uh, all the $16 trillion GDP, the power of Europe uh, is in abeyance as the United States does its unilateral thing in the world. Um, it's, it's quite disturbing to see this kind of thing happening and to see the United States actually being the, the the ingredient, the, the elixir, the magic, if you will, in this uh, turning of the transatlantic relation even into another tool of U.S. unilateral foreign policy and that tool being aimed principally and primarily at the state of Israel and that state security. Uh, I don't, I don't think that should be the number one priority of the United States of America right now. Larry, as you said, uh, Macron's visit was swiftly followed up by uh, Angela Merkel in Germany. And there was speculation in the foreign policy community that this was in order to ensure that uh, Donald Trump would keep the Iran nuclear agreement intact, which is all up in the air at the moment. Um, but it seems that that was not very effective in terms of their ability to convince him. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I think it was sound speculation that that was one of their purposes for coming, if not the primary purpose. But I don't think, I think you're right too. I don't think it worked at all. And what I saw was two leaders um, who essentially retreated to their fortress in Europe uh, without a clue as to what to do in response to a recalcitrant American president who is going to do what he's going to do primarily for domestic political purposes, regardless of what they say or do. I think that was a, uh, an eye opener for them in a series of eye openers for them, but I see no courage in their response to this point. Larry, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Charmaine. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.